Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Great, thank you very much. So it's, uh, it's really a pleasure and honor to be here, and um, I, uh, I, I like the freedom to be able to uh, wander around, so it's, uh, it's really great. So my name is Peter Lee. I um, uh, am extremely pleased to see uh, such a great turnout for our faculty summit. Uh, Latin America is extremely important to us. Um, what I wanted to do uh, with this opening keynote is to give you an idea of how Microsoft Research operates and what we do um, and the role that research plays in our company. And so, let's start. We can. Um, the story I like to tell about research at Microsoft uh, goes back a long way and in fact starts with a particular image, we can, uh, which is this, a stack of pancakes. I, I realized later that maybe this uh, might have been better to, to have a stack of tortillas instead of pancakes, but, uh, but we'll go with pancakes. So, um, so some of you, in fact, many of you in the faculty here and, and some students uh, might be familiar with a classic problem in computer science research uh, known as the pancake flipping problem. Uh, and if not, let me explain it very quickly. So imagine a stack of pancakes and the pancakes are burned on one side. And so when you stack them, you want to make sure to hide the burned side and have only the, the, good, the good side on top. And so now you have a single operation, you can take a spatula and stick it into the stack of pancakes anywhere you want and flip uh, those pancakes over. And so now the question is, given a stack of pancakes, maybe you have n pancakes, minimally how many operations does it take to reverse the order of the pancakes and uh, end up in a state where only the, uh, uh, where all the burn sides are facing down, are still hidden. Now this is a, an old problem, uh, it actually has very direct relevance in several network protocols and some resource scheduling problems and it's actually quite difficult. Uh, even after several decades of work, uh, there are closed form solutions known uh, for n only up to 13 uh, and not beyond that. Um, the reason I like to show this though is that the very first research paper, uh, significant research paper that was published here, uh, was written by Bill Gates in 1979. And this was uh, back when Microsoft was a very, very small company still, as you can see here from the address, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, and incidentally, uh, co-authored with Christos Papadimitriou, who is still uh, quite a distinguished researcher and professor at Berkeley, uh, who we still uh, collaborate with uh, today. The point of this is that from the very beginning, even from the very, very early foundations of Microsoft, um, when Bill Gates was starting the company, the idea of research and the idea that research could be important to the success of a company has been there from, the, from really early on. And as soon as Microsoft became big enough in Bill Gates' eyes, about the time that it reached uh, $1 billion in annual revenues, uh, Bill set out to create Microsoft Research uh, with the help of Nathan Mervold and, uh, and then ultimately uh, Rick Rashid. This uh, importance of research has been very much in the lifeblood of the company. In fact, this is a quote that I really like uh, from Bill Gates back in 2002 where he says, Things like even software verification, and this is a very deep research topic, as you know, even today. Things like software verification, which has been the holy grail of computer science for decades, but now in some very key areas, for example, driver verification, we're building tools, and in fact, we're shipping tools today that do actual proofs about that software, how it works in order to guarantee reliability and security today. And so, uh, research is really something that's just very, very deeply ingrained in, uh, in our company. 
what is the mission of Microsoft Research? Since its founding in 1991, Microsoft Research has had the same three-part mission. And I think of this as really three equal parts of our mission. First, uh, we have the mission to advance the field in the areas we do research. And so that is essentially a statement about our commitment to basic foundational research. Second, when we come across good research results, uh, we're very committed to trying to transfer those uh, into our products and services. And then third, to act as a kind of early warning signal or an insurance policy for the company, to give the company the foresight to look ahead so that the company will be less susceptible to technological surprises, uh, to be able to be first ahead of our competition in the future and thereby ensure the future for the company and its products. And in our lab, we really look at this as a, th as a, a true three-part uh, mission, each one given equal uh, importance. Now, I mentioned about ensuring the future for Microsoft and its products. And for that, I sometimes have a hard time explaining to people what does that actually mean. So imagine going to Steve Ballmer and trying to explain what does it mean for research to ensure the future. And so for that, I actually use a simple test and I'd like to try that simple test with all of you here today. So what I'm about to show you on the screens here uh, is a picture and the picture will contain several circles and dots of different sizes and different colors. And what I want you to do is to determine how many red dots there are. So how many red dots? And you will have five seconds to complete the task. Okay? Is everyone ready? All right, here we go. One, two, three, four, five. Okay? Next. So how many blue dots were there? Does anyone know? One knows. He's a researcher. <laughs> so what's the point of this? Well, our product groups are exceptionally focused and disciplined. They study the customer's needs uh, and develop a product plan, an execution plan. They line up the engineering development and the marketing and sales and show exceptional discipline in just maintaining a, a sharp focus on completing those missions and those product developments uh, and satisfying our customers' needs. But sometimes the world changes and sometimes there are surprises. And in that situation, it's important to have a part of the company, and Microsoft Research Worldwide represents just 1% of Microsoft, to have that part of the company that has the ability and the curiosity to think uh, more curious thoughts. And if necessary, be able to step up uh, and inform the company's executives to be smarter decision makers and also to solve problems and provide new technologies and new inventions, new innovations for the company in response uh, to changing worlds. So for that purpose, Microsoft Research has uh, a global reach. We have seven research labs around the world and three advanced technology laboratories and several research outposts. Uh, I uh, work in Redmond, uh, but here you can see that essentially the sun never sets on Microsoft Research. In total, around the world, we have about 850 PhD researchers and engineers, uh, all really engaged uh, in advancing the field and transferring new technologies into Microsoft. Now, how do we operate and what do we do? Uh, there are three I think main guiding principles. The first one, and maybe the most important one for us, is to hire great people. And once we hire those great people, give them all the resources they need to do their work, and then stay out of the way. My boss, the chief research officer, Rick Rashid, tells me almost every week, Peter, you are not allowed to tell any researcher what to do. And so in that sense, I have the easiest job in the entire company. Uh, I just have to make sure we hire good people and then stay out of the way. Um, we go to great, great lengths to engage with people, to identify great talent, and to hire them. And we do that in many, many different ways. We go uh, and visit universities around the world. Um, we also develop uh, new talent through internship programs and through graduate fellowships. 
And one of our uh, fellowship programs that we're most proud of is our fellowship, graduate fellowship program uh, here in Latin America. And I'm extremely pleased uh, that we have uh, a new PhD graduate fellow from Mexico uh, with us today, and that's uh, Elisa Sheila. Uh, would you stand, please? So uh, why don't you give her some congratulations. So um, Elisa is uh, one of only 10 uh, graduate fellows this year um, in, the, uh, in our uh, global program. Uh, she is a PhD student at the National Polytechnic Institute in Mexico, uh, working under Alexander Gelbo. Uh, and I'm just very thrilled that she'll be starting a 12-week internship with us in Redmond, um, I think later in June. So um, I look forward to seeing you there. So thank you very well, much. Congratulations. We have that form also of engagement with academia. And in fact, this faculty summit is another uh, form of engagement with academia. But really, our most important form of engagement is in our policy to publish openly. Almost everything that we do in the research labs is done in the name of scientific research, and we contribute greatly, in fact, several thousand research papers a year into uh, the uh, scholarly literature. And then finally, our third principle is to embrace diversity in research. And this is a, a little bit of a strange notion, so I'm going to come back to this a little bit later uh, in my uh, keynote talk here. All right, so let's go on. Um, let's talk a little bit about research, and um, let me get to one specific. Uh, area of research, which has to do with uh, audio processing. So one of the areas of research that we have in our lab uh, is in trying to uh, do signal processing for the purposes of better speech recognition, uh, better audio quality and input, um, but also just to satisfy our curiosities. And so we, in fact, do considerable amount of theoretical uh, and engineering-oriented research in various parts of beamforming, audio array processing, echo cancellation, and the like. And these are just some images from some recent results in uh, beamforming uh, using uh, small audio arrays. Now, we take such basic research, which is something that you might refer to as blue sky research, something that is just really motivated by the desire to know more and to understand more. Uh, and uh, is oftentimes largely curiosity driven. But then it can happen that we have ideas like this that we think can be made practical and be made as useful tools or technologies, possibly for our own products and services. And so the research team that was doing work on this beamforming uh, developed uh, this device, which is a test rig. And this is a test rig that uh, has nine microphones. Uh, and then has some back-end processing uh, so that with the nine microphones, it's able to calibrate itself automatically in an arbitrary, say, living room or bedroom, uh, and then have the ability to process the audio so that it can focus its attention on a single point in the space of that room. And so this is a test rig actually that was developed as a part of a project called Natal uh, and was tested in about 500 homes um, uh, mostly in the, uh, in the Seattle area. And so this is an attempt for us to be, uh, go from blue sky research to something disruptive, to try to do something truly new. Once that happens, then there can come a time where we become very mission focused, where a product executive says, we want to turn that technology into a piece of a product. And that technology, in fact, is in the technology of the Kinect. And so what you see here is a, a great product by Microsoft called uh, the Xbox Kinect. And Xbox Kinect is this magical experience because you can interact with a computer without any need to hold a controller or a keyboard or a mouse, just using your body and your body motions and by speaking to the computer, you can have complete control. Well, in fact, in that Kinect, is a four element microphone array that uses the adaptive beamforming in order to 
allow a person to speak from across a living room to the Xbox with perfect clarity. And think about what's required there. There's no button to push to say, I'm going to speak now. You're in an arbitrary living room. It's a very noisy environment with all of your friends playing and shouting and laughing and with the television making it itself a lot of noise. So to give you an idea of what that sounds like, uh, we listen to this. Eh? So what you hear there is just the noise in a living room with people talking and all the music from the TV blurring. And there is actually hidden in that audio someone actually trying to speak to the Xbox. With the beamforming technology, uh, we have this result from the same audio stream. And so you see there's just this amazing kind of magical clarity. And it, for those of you that have experienced uh, interacting with an Xbox through Connect, and you wonder how can it be in this noisy environment that the Xbox sees me and can actually focus on my voice, much as you might focus on a person's voice in a crowded room, uh, it's this type of beamforming technology. And all of this helps contribute to the creation of an innovative product uh, that ultimately, uh, when it came out in 2010, um, became the fastest selling uh, consumer electronics device uh, in all time. So as we move on, the, uh, I mentioned before that as we operate, we operate as an open research lab, so we publish openly. And so in fact, uh, the research behind that audio array for Connect um, was submitted for publication in 2009, about a year before the, the product was on the market. Be for that reason, the researchers were not allowed to uh, mention Connect. Um, and the primary researcher here is Ivan Tashev, um, but we also have uh, Alex Acero. And Alex Acero is here today um, with us uh, attending the faculty summit uh, and a student intern. And so this paper, uh, in fact, I just recently finished reading it. It's a brilliant paper. It really sets out the paradigm for this type of array processing with very small uh, microphone arrays. And of course, we see the results in the Connect. A funny thing, though, about this paper is that it got rejected. Um, and um, of course, many of you here are uh, researchers, and so you've all experienced this. Um, I took some curiosity on this since Connect is one of the things we're most proud of in our lab, uh, and I read the reviews, and the reviews are, are quite revealing. Um, one review uh, says that the solution proposed does not obviously solve the problem at all. Uh, and the other reviews are similarly uh, brutal. Um, I, I kind of like the one that says um, the paper comes up with an idea which has serious drawbacks for realistic scenarios. Um, of course, the reviewers couldn't have known that the paper's ideas would be in over 16 million homes uh, by the next Christmas. Now, there is a point here, though, about this. Um, and in fact, when I first encountered the research work that Yvonne and Alex and others were going through, uh, the, uh, they were showing me their research and I also didn't know too much about Connect and so I remember leaving their lab thinking, well, I'm, I'm very happy they're doing such interesting research, but boy, they seem very, very optimistic about what they can accomplish. And there's an important point there and that point is that there's a very, very thin line between a visionary product concept and science fiction. And in fact, as researchers, as faculty members and as students, we are trained to try to understand this difference between uh, what's a visionary product and what is just fanciful, impossible thinking. And so, as sensible researchers, we find over and over again 
that we try very hard not to do foolish things. I try hard not to do foolish things. And so part of the magic that I find at Microsoft Research is that we can have visionary product designers and developers who say, I would like a technology that allows an Xbox to hear a voice clearly from across a living room in a noisy environment. And it might take a while for that visionary product designer to find researchers willing to try, but the very fact that that discussion takes place uh, gives the conditions where something really magical can happen. And in this case, uh, with the Kinect, um, magic really did happen. Now, as I think about this, the way that I organize our lab's research activities is in something called a quadrants model. And this is something I've been using for the last few years of research management uh, jobs that I've had. The quadrants depict a space of all research activities. So on the x-axis, you start with research activities that only make sense to do if you can get a quick payoff. And then as you go out uh, from the origin, you have research activities that demand patience. Then on the y-axis, we have choices of problems. And so near the origin, you have what I call reactive problems. So a product designer comes and says, I need to be able to solve this audio problem, or this machine vision problem, or this software engineering problem, uh, or this augmented reality problem. And we try hard in those situations to react and be responsive and solve uh, the problem. And then as you move up the y-axis, you enter into a realm which is the more classical open-ended search, curiosity-driven search for truth and understanding and beauty. And so now in this space, you can see in the example that I just gave with Connect that the, this is a cycle, that sometimes we start with blue sky research ideas, but those blue sky research ideas at some point uh, turn into a technology where we're really trying to invent something new, and that technology then can become a mission for the company to actually build a product and try to make it successful. And then once we have that success, uh, then we can try to sustain that success by keep building on the technology and improving it and making it better and better and, um, and, and more and more impactful. And so this quadrant model is something that I've taken, and this gets back to the guiding principle of embracing diversity. One of the wonderful things about computing research is that it is so diverse. We work in mission-focused areas where we identify a societal or company problem and try to solve it. We work in a sustaining mode where we're every day trying to improve what we do and make it better. We do research that is blue sky where we just want to satisfy our curiosities and just push the frontiers of human knowledge a little bit further. And we try to invent new surprising uh, potentially disruptive or game-changing things. And so it's just a wonderful thing in computing research to be engaged in these things and as computing educators to try to teach our students about this wonderful diversity in computing research. And so for that reason, I think uh, we're just absolutely in the best place to be. Um, I'm extremely anxious over the next uh, two and a half days to be uh, have a chance to interact with as many of you as possible and hope that we can share all four quadrants of computing research together. So thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, I'd like to invite you... Perdón, voy a switchar español. Este, quisiéramos invitarlos este, ahora a, a aquí abajo vamos a tener una vamos a hacer una foto grupal con todos ustedes antes sabemos que ya viene la comida y créanme que ya va a estar lista cuando ustedes bajen entonces este, por favor los quisiéramos ver a todos ahí en la foto grupal no se nos vayan a estar escapando este, de veras nos vamos a tomar nada más unos minutos y para el evento es importante tenerlos a ustedes ahí en la foto con todos nosotros. Entonces, este, Peter, thank you so much. Um, we invite everyone to the photo now. Great. 
So thank you so much. See you downstairs. Thank you very much. Thanks.